Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome at our webinar about the chemical safety and incident response in industry by Geert van Bortel. These webinars are organized by the KVCV, or the Royal Flemish Chemical Society, of which I'm going to give you now a short introduction. KVCV is a chemical society of Flanders, so this means the Dutch speaking, the northern part of Belgium. And we are a community of chemists in Flanders and far beyond, because everyone can become a member of our society. And our members mainly are students, PhD students, academics, teachers and professionals. So we really do represent and strive to support everyone within the chemical education industry and society. We mainly organize lectures about popular scientific topics for a general audience or more domain specific workshops. And afterwards, we typically have a networking reception. Here you have an overview of our upcoming events. If you want any more information or for registration, you can always visit our website, kvcv.be slash calendar. Mense Molecula is our magazine, which is distributed to all our members each month. So this means we have 12 editions a year. And uh, in this magazine, you can find news about the chemical industry, about academics, our own activities as well, but also some scientific advancements and much more. And interestingly, uh, you can now request a free sample if you want at our website, kvcv.be slash proof exemplar. But obviously, since this is in Dutch, this is only relevant for Dutch speaking people. If you are a member of our society, we have reduced prices at our activities. You also receive, as already mentioned, our magazine Mens and Molecula, but you are also part of the chemistry community of Flanders, and this really helps you to extend your knowledge and broaden your network. If you are interested in uh, a membership, becoming a member of our society, you can always visit our website, kbcv.be slash membership, and for students, for example, it's only 12 euros a year. So let's stay in touch. You can always visit our website for more information, kvcv.be, or we can also be reached via our social media channels. We have a Facebook page, but also a YouTube channel on which you can rewatch all our webinars again. And we also have a LinkedIn page. And let me then now introduce you to the speaker of uh, today, Gert van Bortel. Gert obtained his Master of Science in Engineering at the University of Antwerp in 1990. After that, he started his professional career at Pluma in the food industry, leading the engineering department, and later on, his job expanded and he became also responsible for maintenance, energy, environment, and safety. In 1996, he joined as firefighter the Voluntary Fire Brigade at Womelheim and became fire officer after a training of six years. Later, he even became head of this fire brigade. In 2000, Hirt decided to make the transition to the chemical industry and started at BISF Antwerp as technical intervention leader with Belintra as one of his tasks. In 2003, he became head of the BISF fire brigade and in 2008, manager operational safety, which included managing of the fire brigade, the site security, transport safety and product safety. On July 2013, he was delegated to BISF in Ludwigshaven and responsible for operational ER part at the BISF site in Germany. And since April 2017, he's global head ER at BISF. Besides his career in industry, he is also a guest teacher and speaker at the KU Leuven, INET, UAMS, University of Antwerp and Vesta about incident management, hazmat, ER planning and sharing all his experiences. So I'm convinced that Gert van Bortel is the perfect person to tell us more about chemical safety and incident response in industry. So Gert, I would say the screen is yours. Uh, thank you, Nathan. I will now try to share my screen. Do you want to continue? Yes, I want. And now I'm sharing. And hopefully it is visible. Uh, okay. You're good to go. 
Okay, good. Thank you very much, Nathan, for the introduction. Welcome to everyone to this uh, webinar uh, in which I will try to explain you some basic issues about uh, safety in the chemical industry, uh, safety culture, process safety, and so on. And hopefully at the end, you have a clear view of how the chemical industry works, how it handles uh, safety and, and um, the the example that I will use is the example of BSF, but as I mentioned, it is comparable with other uh, chemical producers. And at the end, we all aim to have a high uh, safety performance. So it's it's a quite important issue for all uh, uh, chemical producers and the whole chemical industry. So let's start. Um, first of all, first question that you can ask yourself is, um, what is meant with safety, what is a safety culture and so on. Um, and now I'm trying to go to the next slide, which I until now did not see, but yes, here we are. So safety culture, what is a safety culture? Uh, it has to do with beliefs, with perception, and, and, and but of course at the end, uh, your uh, culture is that safe as uh, people live uh, the rules and, and have the right perception and right values to do this. Huh? Um, as I mentioned, you can see, you can have a lot of definitions of safety culture. At the end, you can measure your culture with, with figures, um, LTIs, uh, um, uh, that means fatalities or, or people which are, are, com are coming in contact with, with dangerous goods or a process safety incidents. You have a lot of tools to measure at the end your safety performance and that defines and also your safety culture. Uh, it has to do with your own rules and how far do you follow your own rules. Huh? Nothing more than that. But let's start with the beginning. Uh, when we want to build a new plant on site, uh, then um, the first thing that you have to answer is the question, what do you want to make? Yeah? Um, and here in my example, we want to make a plant to make some mayonnaise. Yeah? Uh, I have uh, also visualized the ingredients which you need to produce mayonnaise. And then uh, first of all, the, the first question or the first uh, design aspect is at the end, at the, at the output of the factory, you want some mayonnaise uh, and the input are the things that I here, have here summarized. And then, of course, you have to ask yourself, OK, I have to mix all these uh, ingredients. And, and for example, you also see that the, there is some oil content and, and even quite a lot. So uh, that is probably um, an, 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 a risk uh, potential uh, in this in this oil mixing, because if you mix too long, you can overheat your oil. It, it, it can can start burning and so on. So you need a kind of um, a safety process to avoid that that accidents happen. And at the end, that the output is the product that you want. Uh, there are things that we all do in a in a safety study. Here again, the ingredients that you need, <clears throat> the machines that you need to, to make this uh, mayonnaise. And at the end, the combination on, and of ingredients and machines uh, defines the operability of, of your thing. And operability means uh, produce what you want. But that doesn't mean that you will produce it on a safe way. Therefore, you need to go or have to take additional steps. And what these additional steps are, that are things that you have to ask yourself and therefore you make a safety study. And in this safety study, um, you know that, that failures can happen. Therefore, it's important that you um, are aware that failures happen, but that you also make up your mind which kind of failures can happen and how will we control these failures. Yeah? Uh, let's start with the primary failures that are failures which can lead to unacceptable consequences that can and these failures can be caused by by instrumentation by a failure of a machine by a lack of energy in in very extreme weather conditions but also people sometimes do things wrong so also manipulation failures can happen uh, and that are all things which you have to calculate uh, in front of the design so that you can handle these kind of failures um you also have to make up your mind de depending secondary failures. That means, first of all, you try to get under control your primaries. But even when you have your uh, primary uh, prevention measures, also secondary failures 
can happen. Huh? That can be uh, uh, a failure of a technical device. Again, uh, the human factor is very important. So also manipulation is here something you have to be aware of. Uh, but you have much more things. Also production can fail. So and also again here you have to take some um, country measures to make sure that when these failures happen, uh, this will not end in in uh, additional damage. Um, I've here summarized some of the measures, but I will try to make this uh, visible. In, uh, in, in the next slides. So here uh, I've tried to summarize it. You have your primary safety measures and that are uh, measures which try to avoid leakages. And the first block of course is that you want operability, you want the, the end product that you have selected. Uh, and if these primary failures occur, then the safety devices which you have installed um, have to avoid that these leakages uh, take place. Although these safety devices to prevent the primary safety measures, you also need uh, additional uh, measures to um, prevent your secondary safety uh, failures. Um, and that can lead to unexpected leakages and so on. And even if your primary and secondary uh, failure measures, if they would not uh, help at the end, then you need um, all these measures until now are uh, designed on a, on a planned uh, level. Then if that would not help you to solve the problem, then at the end you end at a side level and you need a, a, another, another uh, protection layer. And that can, for example, then be emergency services and that can be your own emergency services, but also can be emergency services of the authorities. Nevertheless, you need uh, even, a, uh, even then a last line of defense. Um, I used already several times the word safety study um, and, and what is uh, done in such a safety study. Yeah? First of all, you identify which installations part can come in an unacceptable condition. Yeah? Um, you have to make up your mind what can cause this uh, unacceptable uh, condition. Uh, you also have to define the probability that such a things can happen. And if the probability is lower and, and that can differ from, from uh, company to company, for example, for BSF, when it's lower than uh, time uh, 10 minus six, then, um, then there is no problem because that's a very low probability. But if it is higher, then you have to do um, some things to avoid this. Yeah? Then you have to define your safety targets and also your safety precautions. And, that, and therefore you need this so-called uh, safety study and we make this uh, safety study in five uh, steps and now I will guide you step by step through this uh, safety study. Uh, again, you have to define the risks uh, and, 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 and then define also a basic concept um, for which parts you have to do an additional study. Uh, then you have to define the, the detailed safety study concept and also the hazard and hazard means hazard and operability study. Then you do this hazard for these uh, um, specific, specific parts. Um, after then you have built the whole plant and you have implemented all the, the, the measures that you have defined. Then you do a final checkup before starting up your plant. And at the end, when you have started up your plant, then you also have the responsibility that when you uh, adjust some technical things uh, on the plant, or even if you get some new experiences, that you bring uh, that you have to bring your plant in the in the state of the art condition. That means you have to uh, update and 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 improve your plant all the time by challenging your child yourself and by doing the plan do check adjust uh, process several times to make sure that that you don't forget or don't lose any um, improve uh, improvement potential. So primary process safety targets. The target is there to avoid unacceptable consequences. Yeah. Okay. You can ask yourself, okay, what are un uh, unacceptable consequences? That is damage to people or uh, the environment by as well hazardous, hazardous uh, substances, mechanical effects like explosions and so on, but also thermal effects, which can be caused by a fire. There are things that you have to avoid. How can you avoid them? Yeah. This, for example, is the, the, the plant. 
uh, that we need to uh, produce mayonnaise. Uh, uh, you see some re some reactors where you can mix some things. You see also a cooling device. You see a lot of valves. You see a heat exchanger, pressure control, level control, and so on. And at the end, uh, the end product is mayonnaise. This is the pure um, scheme depending operability. If now we would upgrade this scheme with the uh, measures to avoid um, uh, primary safety uh, problems, then this uh, scheme could be like this. Then you see, OK, we have there um, on the reactor uh, a pressure relief valve. We have, for example, in another reactor, a, a level, a, a low alarm, depending the level, eh, to avoid that your reactor heats up uh, when the level is too low. We have additional temperature controls uh, and so on, and pressure controls. So we are starting to, to uh, impact on the process when low level is reached, when a certain temperature is reached, when a certain pressure is reached, then automatically the process will do some things to avoid an escalation. So these are all technical measures to keep your process under control and to avoid that it will come in an unacceptable uh, situation. That for the primary failures, but I also told you, you also have to be aware when you have protected yourself to these primary failures, also secondary failures can happen. And therefore you can adjust again uh, the same scheme and that you will see now on the next slide. Uh, now, for example, you see that one uh, uh, reactor has a complete fire insulation. Eh? And why? Because, for example, if there would be a release of oil and this would this oil would uh, start to fire, then you have to avoid, of course, that you um, um, heat your reactor because of the fire. And there you have this fire insulation. Suddenly, you also see some fire monitors. You see some block and bleed systems. That means if there would be a release, that this reactor is automatically blocked, but also a release in between so that the, also the pressure cannot rise. You see an emergency power supply to make sure that uh, if there would uh, be an energy problem, that uh, automatically all the essential parts will be um, uh, still have some some power. Uh, you see also if there would be a release, uh, there is also some some gas detection installed, a fire detection installed. You see that are all measures that even if these secondary failures would occur, that you detect them immediately and that they would again have no unacceptable consequences. Even the control room, which is probably in the nearby, here uh, has, has, uh, has a, a siren to warn people in case of an emergency. It is also built on a certain distance that even if an explosion would occur, that it has no impact on this control room and so on. So that are the secondary prevention barriers to avoid that when these secondary failures occur, that they don't have unacceptable impact. Good. We have discussed primary safety measures. We have discussed secondary uh, safety measures. Now, uh, catastrophe uh, protection. So if these both measures would not uh, work 100%, then you still need a plan B. And that is then uh, a plan which is developed on a side level. So then you um, go uh, go to a higher level of protection and, and also the people in the nearby have to be informed and protected. And therefore, I will take the site emergency plan from our site of BSF uh, in Antwerp. Um, and let's start at the beginning. You see here the different block fields with the different plans. And I have uh, focused uh, one plant in the middle with the, the blue plant with the with the uh, red line uh, around this plant. This is the plant where an incident occurs. Yeah? So the primary safety measures have, have been activated. The secondary uh, measures are also installed, but nevertheless, there is a release. The, the detection system has detected this release and what will happen now, okay? Uh, first thing that the plant will do is that he will, uh, the, the plant people in the control room will inform the colleagues 
So they will push an alarm button and we have uh, three different alarm buttons. We have the warning button, the evacuation evic button and the end alarm button. Warning means it's a quite uh, small incident, but nevertheless, all people have to come to a safe haven on, in the plant. Um, and that is uh, when they hear the warning signal. When they hear the evacuation signal, that means also people have to go to safe havens, but not in the plant itself. They have to go to a plant in the nearby and they have to choose this plant themselves depending the wind direction. Um, and then they go to the safe haven over there. And I think the end alarm button is quite clear. Uh, this button and the siren will be pushed as long uh, as soon as everything is under control and then people come back to their um, normal uh, activities. So emergency call number in the plant in Antwerp is 777. And as I mentioned, the plant people in the control room are responsible that they activate the plant sirens to inform their own people. But of course, the plants next to this plant also have to be informed because if there is a release, let's say from a from a from a toxic product, uh, then you can have a toxic cloud, and this will of course not will not stop at the plant borders. Then also the nearby plants have to be informed. The traffic has to stop eh, because also this cloud can be can be flammable, and and uh, a car can be an ignition source. So you also have to stop uh, the traffic. So you also have. Uh, special uh, traffic lights, um, which can be activated also by the plant people. So the people in the plant can activate these stop alarm signs for traffic, but only in the nearby of their own plant. So they can isolate their plant and can avoid that traffic will come to them. So, okay. Uh, and at each um, crossing of roads, we have this kind of uh, traffic lights. You see, um, for example, here uh, on the screen, the the crossings in the nearby of the, the involved plant will be activated, as I mentioned, by the plant itself. Nevertheless, uh, that's a good starting point, but not enough to make sure, but to make sure that not the plants in the nearby are uh, infected of this uh, cloud, and also the traffic, which is probably a bit further away, but which can also be involved uh, because of wind and wind direction, also have to be informed. Therefore, it's important that they call to the uh, call center of the site and they will uh, take this call and they will take additional measures to make sure that uh, all people which have to be informed will be informed. What do they need uh, to do this? They need a clear wind direction. They need the wind speed. They also need uh, the name of the product which is released. And they also need uh, the volume which is released. But the volume is, of course, quite difficult. Um, but to do this um, dispersion calculation, you need uh, a, a certain um, quantity over time. Um, and therefore, we have some fixed model in the software and these fixed models uh, or the fixed figures that we take and which are running in the background is for a small release, we take one kilogram per second. For a medium release, we take 10 kilograms per second. And for a big release, we take 100 kilograms a second. Yeah? Uh, these are figures that we have found out ourselves, but which over the years have proven that they are quite good to start with. And if after a while you see, and very often the, the dimensions we start with are much bigger than we need, but that is no problem. You can afterwards downscale them uh, and downscaling something is much easier than upscaling it because you haven't taken enough uh, uh, measures. So as soon as the call taker has, uh, has given this input in the uh, software system, and I mean wind direction, uh, wind speed, product, and, uh, and quantity, then the system makes a proposal. The system makes a proposal of which plants have to be informed and also which area has to be made traffic free. And then the call taker can accept this proposal and most of the time he accepts. Uh, and if he thinks, no, it's not big enough, then he can increase this area on his own. So 
let's say that the call taker accepts this proposal, then all the plans uh, which are here uh, with a red uh, cross will be uh, the, the, the sirens will be automatically activated and also the traffic in the nearby of these plants will also be blocked by these uh, traffic uh, warning signals. And here you have a, a, a new overview. Uh, the blue measures, uh, sorry, the black measures were taken uh, in the beginning by the plant itself and the escalation has been done by the fire department in the call center by this putting all this information in the software and then the software makes this proposal. All the things that I just told you, and I mean from starting of the release until taking all these actions, that requires one maximum two minutes. Because of course, I think it has to be clear if something like that happens, you have to react very quickly to avoid that you have additional uh, damage or problems with your people. So this really has to be very fast. And that's also the reason that we have these very sophisticated, but nevertheless, very accurate and, and good systems. Um, so what has the plant, uh, affected plant has to do uh, further? They have to bring their process in safe conditions. So when there is a product release, they have to block and bleed reactors. They have to depressurize them. Um, they have to make sure that all the product which is released will go to a, to a safe uh, area. Um, so they have to do all the things to limit the impact. And of course, they also have to inform their people. The measures of the plants which are not affected or where there is no release, they have to do what is written down in uh, so-called alarm printers, because in each control room, we have alarm printers or an alarm printer. And as soon if something goes wrong on site, the whole site will be informed by this printer. And as soon as a message comes out of this printer, um, there also will be a kind of an acoustic alarm so that they can hear, okay, I have an important message, come to me, read these messages and, and do what they tell you to do. And what is then the, the job of the call center? As I mentioned, they have to inform all the plants about the situation. They have to uh, block the traffic and also they have to inform the authorities because also the authorities, of course, are informed. And what also the call center does, they send the, the, the emergency teams uh, on scene. When people go to safe heavens, it is for us very important to make sure uh, is everybody in the safe heaven or is probably someone still in the plant. To check that, we have a kind of an, uh, an, an, an system where people have to identify themselves when they enter some uh, safe heavens. So in normal conditions, when you go to a plant, you have your personal batch and then you have to batch in, in the plant and you appear somewhere on the list. As soon as there is an alarm in this plant, they exactly know who is there yeah, because you're all listed up in this, uh, in this uh, um, registration tool. So as soon as the alarm signal uh, sounds or you have to go to safe heaven in the plant for a warning system uh, signal or you have to go to a plant in the nearby uh, when it is an evacuation alarm. Nevertheless, when you come in this safe heaven, Again, there is a kind of a batch terminal. Again, you have to batch with your uh, uh, batch. And then you will disappear on the list in the affected plant. And as soon as all the names are gone, then we as uh, emergency responders are sure, OK, the installation is now completely free. No more people are there. So we don't have to worry about them. They are all in a safe area. So registration is a very important thing. And, and also we demand also discipline from our employees to use this tool on a proper way and not to forget to batch in and such a things because that can be um, uh, very difficult in case of an uh, emergency. To make sure that people also know exactly what to do. And I think for your own people, it's uh, after a while not that, that difficult, but we also have a lot of visitors or contractors or whatever. Therefore, we also have these plant alarm cards in several languages where they can find the safe heavens, where they can find the alarm signals, 
where they can find the emergency call numbers and where they can also find uh, how they have to behave during an emergency. And on the back side of these cards, they can also find for each plant, not all the products that they have in this plant, but all the hazards which are um, in this plant. Yes? For example, toxic or, or whatever. Huh? That is all uh, mentioned in these cards and, and is a, a useful tool for people which are not so common with this, with this, uh, this type of installations. How does the fire station at uh, BSF in Antwerp looks like? Uh, uh, not different from a normal uh, fire station, I would say. Uh, we also have red trucks. Uh, we also have a lot of people. We have uh, a control room. And here, specific in Antwerp, for example, also the, the uh, process safety department and occupational safety department are also in the same building as the fire brigade. So I think that is also useful uh, because uh, after uh, emergencies, um, they have to analyze them. And then it's uh, very uh, easy that you have very short ways between occupational safety, process safety, and fire department. So I think that's really a benefit. Uh, here you see the uh, emergency services during an exercise uh, in the tank farm. Here you see an, an how in uh, the emergency call center looks like. We have all the time two people in this alarm uh, emergency call center. Um, one is talking to the emergency services which are on scene, and the other colleague is talking with the control room in which the incident takes place. Um, we have, as I mentioned, um, the last slide of the that is, uh, emergency response team, and they do all the operational things. But nevertheless, if something like that would happen, you also have to take some strategic strategic decisions. You have to communicate uh, to the press. You have to uh, stay in contact with the authorities. So you also need a strategic team, and that is our crisis management team. In Antwerp, for example, this team consists out of six members, uh, someone of management level, someone uh, representing the safety department, communication department, HR, engineering, and also a kind of an assistant who does all the logging. And, and he will uh, make the protocol and write down all the decisions that they take in this uh, team. That is the last line of defense on site. For us as chemical industry, logistic is also a very important topic and also a very important license to operate. And therefore, we also have an agreement, at least the Chemical uh, Federation in Belgium has an agreement with the Ministry of Internal Affairs uh, in which uh, they agree that if something happens during um, transport and the local authorities would have some problems with getting the incident under control, then they can ask help from the chemical industry. Yeah? Uh, the name of this agreement in Belgium, for example, is Belintra. But we do not only have these kind of agreements in Belgium, we have these kind of agreements all over Europe. Yeah? Um, this is also an initiative of, uh, of CEFIC, the uh, European Chemical Federation. And this uh, uh, working group within CEFIC is the so-called ICE uh, working group. And I'm also chairman of this European uh, ICE uh, working group. So I'm responsible within CEFIC also for uh, the connection between all the European countries to do some experience exchange, to test the system and to make sure that when the system is needed, that it also will work. Uh, and nowadays we are um, working uh, very successful in 16 European countries. Um, and as I mentioned, it is really to support the local authorities. Uh, what kind of support can we uh, deliver them? We can deliver them the three levels of support. The first level is um, uh, advice by telephone. That means uh, the local uh, local fire brigades have a problem. They can call a an, an Belintra uh, call center and ask for help, uh, advice. Uh, that can be uh, give us the safety data sheets or, or give us more uh, information depending the products and so on. 
Second level of support is that we send a product expert on scene. Uh, for example, we had in the past, um, uh, for example, an, an, an accident on the on the highway with uh, liquid sulfur, and then the authorities asked an expert depending liquid sulfur. We also had already accidents where oxygen were, was involved. Then they asked an expert depending uh, liquid oxygen, and so. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a second level of, of support that we offer that is a uh, product expert on scene. And then the third level of support is that we really send some uh, intervention teams on scene to help the authorities with, let's say, doing a transfer from a product uh, in, in a damaged tank to an, an undamaged tank so that uh, transport can go on. Um, I also brought some examples with me to give you a kind of an idea uh, what kind of uh, support we can deliver, but also hopefully then you will understand why it is sometimes difficult for the local uh, fire brigade to solve these kind of problems because sometimes they don't uh, have the knowledge or the, the expertise to do this, but very often they also don't have the tools uh, to do this. So, and therefore I think it's useful that uh, the industry help them uh, during these things. Here, this was a ship in the port of Antwerp. This ship was uh, partly loaded with uh, fertilizer, an NPK uh, fertilizer, which is nit nitrate-based uh, fertilizer. And uh, unfortunately, uh, because of rolling activities in the hole uh, next to the hole with uh, fertilizer, um, there, was, there were, as I mentioned, uh, welding activities. And because of these welding activities, a decomposition of the of the fertilizer fertilizer uh, took place. Um, it was around about three thousand tons, and you could see it was very impressive uh, when when the decomposition was at, at the highest point uh, and and the heatest point also uh, massive uh, NOx uh, releases. Uh, and in this case, for example, we were also asked to help the authorities to to get this thing uh, under control. Next example here was uh, during emptying a container uh, ship. Um, the, they lifted out uh, the container that you now see on the picture here. And when this container was in its, its highest uh, point, one of the twist locks, and so a, a twist lock is a connection point to lift these containers, one of the twist locks uh, broke down, which caused that the container fell down in the ship again for around about 30 meters. And you can imagine because of the impact as well, the upper container was damaged, and that mean was leaking, uh, but also the container below uh, was leaking. Uh, inside the whole of the ship, it is not, uh, not that easy to handle these kind of problems because then you're really in, an, in a confined space. Um, the vapors of uh, the both products were flammable and toxic. They were also heavier than air. That means you're building up an explosive atmosphere uh, inside the ship. And of course, you don't want an explosion and you will do everything to avoid that. Um, what was the solution? Um, we first tried to ventilate the ship as good as possible to reduce the, the, the explosion level. Um, then we build up a complete uh, transfer installation with pump and hoses and so on. And we did the transfer of the first damaged con damage container inside the ship into another one. And this is which you can see on the, the biggest picture. Once that job was done, uh, we uh, took out the damaged container with, with a crane. And then also uh, afterwards, we took out the second uh, damaged container also with the same crane, put it on a big um, pit uh, to make sure that all the product which was still leaking uh, was kept together. And then we made a, a second setup with again a pump and so on and did then also do a transfer of the second damaged container in another one. So also in this uh, incident, for example, we were around about three days on scene. Um, was also a big issue in the harbor because a big area was was blocked for traffic and so on uh, because of this hazardous potential. And again, here I think this is something specific uh, which can be done by the chemical industry because we have the pumps, 
we have the hoses, we have all the equipment that you need to do this. We have also the nitrogen and so on to do these kind of transfers. And there, I think it's much more difficult for the authorities to do this uh, because they, they do it for probably only once in a lifetime. And that is then for, for critical products, uh, probably not enough as experience. And therefore, I think um, the help from the industry is very useful. Another uh, example that I brought with me is uh, an, uh, a truck with Bromine, uh, also in the port of Antwerp. Um, you see, made a rollover. Um, and uh, because of this rollover, uh, the tank with Bromine um, was also damaged, which caused that there was a liquid Bromine release. Uh, you can see also in the background, this uh, bit brown uh, cloud that are the Bromine vapors. I think there was all about around about 6,000 uh, liters of bromine uh, released with a density of around about three, I think. So that means around about uh, 20 tons of bromine was over there on the street and also partly in the sewer system. Um, to avoid escalation, um, you, of course, you have to knock down uh, the vapors because they will spread by the will be spread by the wind, and this you can do on, on different ways. You can do this with uh, uh, water, uh, which is uh, quite efficient. But nevertheless, after a while, you have quite some water contaminated with bromine, and you have to keep all this liquid together, uh, not to to poison the whole area. Uh, and therefore, for example, we proposed the local authorities to do this not with water, but to do this with, and now I think, yep, uh, with gaseous ammonia. If you do this with gaseous ammonia, you see what will happen. You see the chemical reaction uh, also on, in the slide. Um, and then you don't have any um, contaminated uh, liquids. You only have some solids, ammonium bromide, yeah. You can uh, bring them easily together, put them in a plastic bag, and you can uh, uh, take them away. So yes, you can do it with water, but you have more efficient uh, methods. Only you have to have the knowledge to do this. And of course, you have to also have the, the, the gaseous ammonia to do this. Yeah, And that are, again, typically things uh, which we can offer from the chemical industry. I also told you that uh, there was also some bromine in the sewer system, which of course is also a bad idea because uh, these sewer systems are made of concrete and this bromine will attack the concrete. And after a while, you will, don't, you will not have any concrete anymore in, in, in the ground and that would, be, have, would have big impact on the sewer systems uh, and that for more, uh, for several kilometers. And that is of course also something where the authorities were worried about. So uh, they also asked us to help them uh, with this problem. And then uh, we added some other chemicals in the sewer system, which could then neutralize this bromine in, in, in harmless bromine uh, uh, product, uh, 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 yeah, sodium bromide, uh, which is this normal salt. Yeah? And, and I, I think, uh, also, this was done on a successful way. Afterwards, we also sent some robots into the sewer systems to take samples to see how many bromine was still in the sewer system. But then we saw that because of this chemical reaction, there was no free bromine anymore. So also the attack on the concrete was, was over. And uh, again, this incident then afterwards was uh, under control. Again, I think this is a, a typically or a typical solution for the chemical industry, which is probably for people who are not used to work with chemicals on a daily basis. It's not so easy to implement uh, these kind of solutions, or probably uh, it's it's difficult to find these kind of solutions. Um, we don't have only accidents in the port of Antwerp. We also have uh, in in the Belgium area uh, in, in 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 the nearby of Lutich, uh, Lutich uh, uh, yeah, some some comparable uh, problems. Here is a, a train incident. Uh, we were also asked on scene. What was here uh, the problem? Again, uh, train derailment, as I mentioned, and uh, very hazardous substances were also involved here. Butyl acrylate, acrylonitril, and carbon, carbon disulfide. Yeah? Uh, again, same scenario. 
um, help was asked. Um, we come on scene, we look with, with what kind of camels are involved, which uh, containers are filled, which are empty, and then we start with typically uh, chemical solutions. Because here also the fire potential was quite high. We also brought this turbo extinguisher with us um, to make sure if a fire would occur, that we could uh, keep this fire under control immediately. Um, and therefore, we also have to do some tests, of course, in the beginning. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, one was filled with butyl acrylate. Um, he was uh, completely filled, but not leaking. So that was for us a normal uh, transfer. Then we had two uh, rail tanks, or two yeah, real rail tanks filled with acrylonitrile. They were empty, but not vented. That means that the containers as such were total loss, but there is still some, some rest acrylonitrile inside. And of course, also a lot of vapors inside. So uh, there it was um, um, purpose to, to take the rest volume or rest, rest liquid, which was inside uh, to um, uh, bring it in contact with absorbent so that uh, it would not affect the soil. And then last but not least, there was also one uh, filled with carbon disulfide, yeah. Also a hazardous uh, chemical. As you can see here on one side, it was uh, was uh, hit by uh, steel profiles and uh, the tank bottom was really very badly damaged. Uh, and for that container, we also organized uh, an, uh, a transfer. How did we do this transfer? Uh, carbon disulfide is a bit uh, a critical product because you also need um, explosion-free equipment, uh, T6 uh, equipment that is uh, very rare on the market. Um, we have some T6 pumps, but nevertheless, we try to avoid to use them because even using them for this kind of chemicals is, can be very critical. And therefore we preferred to do the transfer with, uh, with nitrogen. Uh, and then press over the liquid with nitrogen from one container to another. In this case, also the authorities asked us to, to empty the carbon disulfide containers completely uh, because they want to cut them in pieces unseen. So they wanted also to avoid that they had, that they had to transport them afterwards over, uh, over the roads. And therefore they decided, no, they have to be uh, emptied completely, cut in pieces and then uh, brought um, for for remediation somewhere else. As I mentioned, we first emptied them with uh, nitrogen as good as possible, but then you still have a rest volume inside. And this rest volume, uh, we also uh, brought in contact with other chemicals, uh, sodium hypochlorite, um, I, at least a sodium hypochlorite solution, and uh, by a chemical re re uh, reaction, the carbon disulfide was then uh, transferred in um, sulfuric acid, CO2, and salts. Yeah, and, and that was then the easiest way for us to handle this uh, problem and also to find a good uh, solution. Yeah? Of course, because it is a chemical reaction, you also have to keep your reaction temperature under control uh, to avoid that you would have a, a chloride release or something like that. Uh, but nevertheless, um, if you know, uh, what you're doing, then I think it's also not easy to keep things under control, but then you can build in some, some safety measurements uh, to make sure that things are going in the right direction. And as you can see, um, all the, the equipment that we used doesn't look that highly sophisticated. Uh, I would even call it... Uh, uh, almost the, the MacGyver method. Uh, that means we have to very often with very poor uh, equipment, we have to do a lot of things. Uh, but as I mentioned, we have we have a good uh, preparation. We have good preparation plans, and and at the end, all the things we need, we can bring them together uh, to do these these transfers on a proper way. Um, here again, uh, how at the end we succeeded to empty these containers completely. We have to uh, check pH, we had to check uh, temperature to make sure that there was no uh, chlor release. And at the end, uh, as, as soon as we, we 
um, they saw that the pH of, of the mixture was uh, stabilized, which means there was no conversion anymore in, in sulfuric acid. Uh, the neutralization was uh, completed. Last but not least, I think we also had the big um, train derailment also in Belgium in uh, May 2013 in Wetteren. Um, also quite big, uh, five rail tanks, acryl and nitrile were involved, two rail tanks with butadiene, and then also two rail tanks with very uh, reactive chemicals, uh, ethyl aluminium dichloride and triethyl aluminium. Um, no BSF products, but nevertheless, when they ask chemical industry to help, then we will help, of course. This uh, completely complete train was a trans uh, transport from, the, from Germany uh, to the Netherlands, which was passing through Belgium. So Belgium didn't have anything to do uh, with this uh, with these chemicals, but nevertheless, as I mentioned, when the authorities ask us, we know that uh, transport for us is a very important license to operate. So then, of course, we come on scene and help. Them. No issue. Here you can see the picture with the composition. You see the five acrylonitrile rail tanks, the two the two butadiene tanks, and also a bit further these two very reactive uh, chemicals. The first steps when we arrived, we saw, not, of course, that uh, it was not so far away from a residential area uh, and uh, all the residents were already evacuated, no problem. But we saw that the firefighters were uh, trying to extinguish this fire. Um, because of the local situation, they had to come very close. And probably I will go a bit back here, as you can see, um, it was not the easiest place to extinguish. Uh, the water supply was very poor. It was also um, not so easy to get uh, to the scene of the incident. And you had to come quite close to have some extinguishing impact. And that for us was then the reason to say, okay, um, let it burn. Um, the only thing we will uh, try to avoid is that these uh, two rail tanks with uh, butadiene uh, will explode. That is the main purpose. And uh, the acrylonitrile, let it blow, uh, let it burn because it's, it's, it's too dangerous to come so close to extinguish. Um, so let's cool the whole area and try to avoid this uh, blevy. Um, because uh, we could not exclude a blevy, we had to uh, inform and warn a bigger residential area to close doors and windows, uh, downwinds for around about 2,000 meters. Um, we also um, asked people again to wear personal protection, uh, which were in the nearby, to make, because acrylonitrile is also toxic uh, and is also penetrating through your skin. Um, we started also a complete measuring program to see what, uh, how far, far these uh, vapors of acrylonitrile uh, went. And because, um, as I mentioned, uh, acrylonitrile is also toxic. Uh, and if you are contaminated with acrylonitrile, you need um, antidote uh, to stop the chemical reaction in your body. And therefore, we, you need these so-called cyano kits which are not available in every hospital. So also we as chemical industry brought this, uh, these kits with us. So if someone would be contaminated, that at least the things that you need to help these people are available on scene. Uh, we also, because acrylonitrile is also a reactive uh, chemical, uh, which uh, can start a decomposition when it is heated up. Uh, this is something that you can avoid when you add some stabilizing agent, and that is also the reason why we brought these stabilizing agents with us. Of course, we check whether there is a connection to, the, to a sewer system, uh, and they promised us that there was no connection. So, uh, okay, we damped the streams in the nearby to avoid uh, further contamination, and everything was okay. At least we thought. Here again, a picture of the scene of the incident and also uh, the residential area in the nearby. Uh, one day later in the morning, uh, people in the city of Wetteren 
uh, called uh, the local fire brigade and told them that they had a strange smell in their houses and in the streets. And uh, depending the wind direction, that normally should be impossible because the wind came from the other direction. So we were a bit suspicious. And although we asked and they confirmed that there was no um, connection to a sewer system, they found out that there was a connection to a sewer system. So what happened, acrylonitrile also came in this system and was on its way to the water purification system, which, which you can also see on the slide here. That means the sewer system was under the roads, uh, which here are in, uh, in the blue color. And exactly also this area was affected from this uh, special smell. So that meant uh, a new Evacuation had to take place. Another uh, few thousand people had to be evacuated. Also, the local uh, crisis team, which was in one of these roads also in, in the building, also had to be evacuated. So the impact increased. Then we also, at least that was the job of the police and the local fire brigade to inform people in these streets uh, to make sure that they left their houses. Um, and there we also received um, uh, many reactions from the police, but also from fire brigades that when they uh, knocked on the door or tried to reach people in their houses, that people were looking through the windows. But in the beginning, they were not so happy to leave their houses. Some people didn't want to leave their houses. Nevertheless, there was an, a toxic uh, cloud in the nearby. So at the end, uh, police forced them uh, out of their houses. Uh, to bring them in a safe uh, area. When we do these kind of interventions, um, for us, uh, health is, is a very important uh, topic. And therefore, we also monitor our people uh, very frequently. Um, we have a list with substances. And when, once we come in contact with one of these substances, uh, every time we do biomonitoring. And how do we do this? Then you have to give a blood or a an, uh, urine sample. They analyze the sample and then they see whether you have uh, some substances or related substances in your urine or your blood. And when they find them, okay, then there was a contamination and then something went wrong because we have all the equipment to protect us in a proper way. So this should not happen. But nevertheless, we check it every time and if we find something uh, which could go in a direction that someone is contaminated, then we want to, want to find out what went wrong so that we can avoid this in the future. So for us, biomonitoring is kind of a quality control to make sure that we work on a proper way. And also in the period that we were in veteran, uh, the authorities saw that we were um, uh, giving urine samples on a daily basis. Uh, they asked us why we did this. Uh, we explained them. And then uh, a lot of citizens also in veteran were a bit uh, in panic because they all thought that they would be contaminated with chemicals. So the authorities asked us whether we could help them with doing a biomonitoring campaign uh, for their citizens and for all the people, uh, emergency responders, which helped during this intervention. And of course, also in this case, we helped two authorities to set up this biomonitoring um, campaign. Um, and what we found out was also that in, in several houses, they, have, they had uh, old connections uh, to the sewer systems. Normally, your, sewer, your internal sewer system or your internal system is, is, uh, is separated from the sewer system by a siphon or something like that. But in, in quite old houses, you don't have this siphon and there is a direct connection between the sewer system and your internal system, which causes that vapors which are in the sewer system, you can also smell in your house. And that was, for example, one of the reasons that an older man uh, died. Uh, they found him um, two days after the, the incident in his house because his daughter was a bit uh, concerned they phoned the local uh, authorities because she couldn't contact or had, didn't have any contact anymore with her father. 
Um, then the police went to his house. They had been knocking on his door, but he didn't answer. Um, and as I mentioned, two days later, they found him dead in his house. Um, A, because probably he didn't hear, he didn't hear um, the knocking on his door or he heard and he didn't want to go out. And secondary, uh, as I mentioned, this, he had no siphon system, which separated his internal installation from the sewer system, which caused that the acrylonitrile nitrile came also in his, in his house. Um, and then he, he died in his living room together with his, with his dog. Um, what was the result of the campaign? Um, uh, uh, you can see it here on a, on a slide. This is the result for the emergency responders of the authorities. Um, in, you have a difference between smokers and non-smokers. Yeah? Um, and what is the difference? Also in cigarettes, you have some acrylonitrile. In the cigarette smoke, you have some acrylonitrile vapors. So people who smoke uh, have a higher uh, levels in their blood than people who don't smoke. And that's the reason why they make the difference between non-smoking people and smoking people. From the non-smoking people, 77% uh, was clean. And in 23%, they found a value which was higher than the reference value. For the non-smokers, um, the contamination or contaminated uh, con uh, people uh, was, was uh, a bit higher. That was not 23%, but it was 43%, and only 57% uh, was not contaminated. Um, the reason uh, or the explanation uh, was that uh, smokers also don't smell that good anymore. Uh, that is then also the reason that they stay longer in, in contaminated areas. And of course, then also the contamination at the end is higher and more people are contaminated. So if I would show you the figures of, of um, BSF firefighters, we, we are uh, below 1%. Uh, but as I mentioned, we do this all the time and, and do this really as, as a quality control. This was the first time that such a campaign was done by uh, emergency responders of the authorities. And um, yeah, uh, I think we, we, together with them, learned a lot uh, and we saw a, a lot of potential to improve for the future. Here you can also see um, the results of the campaign for the um, uh, people which were living in these uh, streets. And you can see exactly the roads where the, the, the sewer system was under, hey, the road with the roads with a lot of red dots. Uh, and the red, a red dot is every, every time a contaminated citizen. And you see above this uh, sewer system, uh, they found several people which were contaminated, but very strange. They also found people which were contaminated, which were not living in these streets. And then they interviewed also these people afterwards. And then, of course, uh, people had to admit, yes, uh, during the intervention, I was a bit interested. So I went for a walk with my dog and we came in the nearby. And probably at that uh, uh, time of the day, we were then were a bit contaminated. So um, that was then also the reason that we found some red dots in not uh, contaminated areas. At the end, the municipal and provincial alarm plan was activated. Around about 2,000 people were activated. Around about 400 people were in the hospital with complaints. Uh, three people were critical um, and had to be helped with this so-called antidote, which we brought with us from Antwerp. And also, as I mentioned, one elderly man and his dog uh, died. And now you can ask yourself, OK, what was the reason uh, of this um, derailment? Uh, the reason was uh, excessive speed. Uh, speed in this area, which was allowed, was 40 kilometers an hour. And the train had a speed of uh, 87 kilometers an hour. Yeah, And that was the reason of the accident or the derailment. Here you can see this turbojet during the cooling uh, activities. 
as I mentioned, it was on purpose that we didn't extinguish the fire that was too risky uh, because you had to come quite close. We obtained this solution to cool down, to avoid uh, the blevy, and that is also at the end uh, what uh, happened. Uh, no explosion took place and uh, the contamination was quite good under control. Of course, at the end, we had still these two tanks with uh, butadiene. You also have to do something with them because also butadiene is, is reactive. It can also build some um, peroxides. And therefore, we decided not to transfer the butadiene in another tank. We decided to flare the butadiene on scene, so to burn the butadiene on scene. Uh, to make sure that uh, no uh, polymerization reaction would start and that also no peroxides would be built. Um, this is also something typically for the chemical industry. I think it's quite difficult for a local fire brigade to organize uh, a flare installation for uh, butadiene rail tanks. So we build up the whole situation uh, on scene and then we flared uh, for about 100 tons of butadiene uh, on scene in veteran uh, during uh, one day and one night. Huh? Uh, the press was uh, very interested because they wanted to see these huge flames. Huh? We had to disappoint them because we, uh, we reduced the flow to keep the flames uh, under control. Uh, of course, you have to um, transfer the butadiene. Uh, first, this is quite easy because it has its own uh, vapor pressure. But after a while, when all the liquid is out, um, you have to uh, repressurize it. And there you, therefore, you use uh, nitrogen to repressurize it. And then you can uh, burn the rest of the butadiene, which is in the tank. And this is exactly what you see here on this uh, picture. This is the mobile flare in detail. And when the rail tanks with butadiene were also emptied, then uh, the next problem was there was a uh, quite big contamination uh, with acrylonitrile. Uh, and now the, we, the, the, the authorities asked us to help them with a, a remediation plan, to build up a remediation plan, because they didn't know how to handle this. Um, so we brought them in contact with, um, with our experts uh, to organize the, the bottom a remediation, but also um, other teams to clean the rail tanks, uh, to neutralize the rest chemicals which are in the rail tanks. Uh, also the purification system of veteran, the, um, the bio, uh, biological slime was also uh, killed by the high uh, toxic uh, concentration of acrylonitrile. So we also delivered them uh, new organic mass for their purification system. We helped them uh, building up this remediation plan. Um, and I think around about a half half year later, this complete area was remediated. Um, the only thing which had to stay over there a bit longer was um, a biological uh, purification system for the groundwater. Uh, they needed, I think, around about one year to clean uh, the groundwater in the area. But at the end, after one year, uh, the complete contamination was gone uh, and was back in, in, this, in this original state. And don't forget, as I mentioned, in this case, round about 300 tons of acrylonitrile was released. OK, there was a fire. Also, uh, a lot of this uh, product was, was burned. But nevertheless, there was still a big contamination. But also there, uh, we see it as our job as chemical industry to help authorities not only by uh, in the in the hot uh, phase, but also in the phase afterwards, it is very important to to handle these problems on a proper way to make sure that you don't have a problem for years. Uh, therefore, you need a clear plan, uh, the right experts, and that is exactly all the knowledge that we also have in the chemical industry. And then we're also glad to help the authorities to solve these kind of uh, problems. As I mentioned, the logistic is for us. Uh, a very important uh, thing and, and uh, an important license to operate for us. 
Of course, and also uh, communication uh, is important, as you can see here. Uh, we during this is very typically also during this kind of in interventions, there is a lot of press, and there were there is a lot of press. Uh, you see also now and then some politicians, um, and it doesn't matter in which phase of the of the intervention you are at that time. When the politicians arrive, you have to stop. You have to <laughs> you have to leave the area because then the politicians want to see the area, and when they have left, you can do for doing your job. Huh? Also very typically. Okay. I think in the beginning. I wanted to explain you how we do safety studies, how we uh, make our concepts to produce on a safe way. And at the end, you can say every our, our safety concept is a multi-layer concept. Huh? We have technical devices to protect uh, our installations. We have installations for secondary failures. We have organizational organizational uh, measures. Um, we have uh, a lot of things and that are all barriers. And every barrier, when something goes wrong in a barrier, there is a hole in the barrier. And only when you have holes in all your barriers, then this could lead to an incident. And here you can see the incident where the incident happened and next to the, to the incident, you very often have the citizens. So if an incident happened, the next thing you have to do is to call the emergency services. That can be the services on scene. And if you don't have any services on scene, then you call the, the uh, services from the authorities. And as soon as they arrive, they will install the next layer of protection with the emergency measures, but also in this layer, there can be a hole, and only when there is a hole in this last layer, then uh, people in the nearby can be affected. As, for example, in Wetter, this, this older man who was living alone in his, in his house, the only hole in this um, safety layer was that there was no uh, siphon between his own installation and the sewer system, which caused that the vapors came into his house, and that was the reason that this man uh, died. That was the hole in this emergency measure plan, uh, which we did not calculate with what, but it was uh, at the end a uh, reality, which we had to face. I think, and I hope that you have mentioned that we do a lot of things to avoid incidents to avoid leakages, to avoid fires, to avoid that something goes wrong with our chemicals. And very important in this whole process are the people, because the people make your success. Their safety skills, they define your safety culture. So first of all, you need people who accept that there are safety rules, they, they accept that you have to follow the safety rules um, and also that you have to trust the safety rules and that you have to contribute to improvement. Yeah? If you see things which you can improve, then don't hesitate, don't be shy, no, tell it and try to improve them together with your team. Safety is not important for the team, it's also very important for yourself. Safety rules are there to create a safe work environment and to be followed up. This is very important. And as I mentioned, if you hesitate, if you don't understand anything, uh, something, have the stop reflex, in which I mean, don't hesitate when you um, when things are not clear for you. Say stop, please. Can you explain me again? And and don't let you guide by other people's if you don't understand the things. No, stop let them explain you again so that you understand, so that you are convinced that the things which they are doing are the right things. And only when you're convinced, then go to the next step. And that is the attitude that we want that our employees have. Live safety every day and that as well top down as bottom up because safety is really the license to operate and has to be lived every day. So we as chemical industry at the end, 
uh, we are convinced that with a clear safety philosophy implemented with fire and conviction in your organization, then safety and chemistry can go hand in hand and chemistry can be done on a safe way. I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm now open for any kind of questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Gert, for your talk. Um, so if the audience still has questions, you can always put them in the Q&A section and then I'll ask them to the speaker. We already have uh, some questions. So the first one is, is there a percentage of how much investments are made on safety measures, such as uh, personal instruments, precautions, or things like that? Um, I think that's a um, question which I can answer quite easily because um, over the years we have uh, experienced that when you do an investment, around about 50% of this investment is safety related. So for example, uh, now in Antwerp, I think they're building a completely new uh, ethylene oxide uh, plant with, with also some other products. That's a total investor of around about 500 millions over three years, I think. So 50% of these 500 millions is only for safety. Yeah. Uh, also um, to, to renew infrastructure and so on. I think also for the next years, there is also an investment for, for around about 750 millions. Also again, 50% is round about only there for safety. So it's, it's quite a lot of money. Okay, that's clear. Um, the next questions are unaccept are unacceptable consequences legally defined or captured in regulation or is it more uh, company dependent? It is, uh, the Germans would say nein, jein, uh, uh, that means yes and no. <laughs> um, yes, of course, uh, authorities uh, define some things, but they don't define everything. So it is an, a combination of, of legislation and uh, company culture. Okay. Um, then about one of the interventions. So how was the ammonia dispersed to knock down the bromine vapors? Um, it was, uh, we had some bottles with liquid ammonia and we, with, with some dip pipes inside. So we turned them around because you can always only can bring the, the gas phase in contact with the gas phase. And that was simply done by connecting hoses. And one of, of my guys, the one in, in the yellow suit was spreading this gas with ammonia in this Broman cloud. And I think 50 to, to 100 meters further, other colleagues of me were measuring and if they measured an ammonia concentration, then they reduced the ammonia uh, amount. And when they measured some bromine, but then I really mean in, in, in PPM level or PPB level, then they increased the ammonia um, uh, amount because there is no clear rule uh, how many ammonia, because it's very uh, difficult to estimate how many bromine is there in the air. So this is really, uh, improving by measuring and, and, and almost, I would say, training on a job. Eh? Because uh, yes, of course, we did this kind of tests in front, but we did them in, 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 in small scale. And this was for us also the first time that we really upscaled it in, in, in this kind of dimensions. Eh? So this is really um, almost, uh, yeah, testing on, on scene and, and uh, by measuring, uh, trying to improve your, your, the volume that you bring in the air to, to to have an optimum, optimum, uh, a perfect uh, conversion. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, then I was uh, wondering: Are the most in incidents uh, due to human mistakes, or uh, mainly by errors in the in the the plants itself? Or um, at the end, I focused on the human impact, and uh, I have to admit, uh, I think more than 90% of the cases is the human factor. But because most of the time when you install technical tools uh, and you connect them with a certain logic, this logic does what you expect. Yeah. And um, logic is predictable. People are sometimes less predictable. Yeah. And, and logic doesn't make interpretations. It is yes or no. Yeah, 
Uh, and it is yes when you say it has to say yes, and it is no when you say it has to say no. People are different. People um, have their own experience. Um, they have their own uh, mind. They have good days. They have bad days. They forget. They don't forget. And and very often, um, human being is is uh, or human action is 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 the reason of an of an incident. Yep. Okay. Um, I don't know if you mentioned it during uh, your presentation, uh, but I was wondering as well: um, Are there still uh, so today still um, health problems? Caused, uh, caused by the incident in veteran or not anymore? Um, as far as I know, I don't think, but it could be that I don't have all the information. Uh, at least uh, one thing, as I mentioned, it was clear. Uh, we were all a bit surprised uh, of the high percentages of, of, of uh, contaminated people. Huh? And uh, I showed you, I gave you only the figures of the of the emergency responders. That means firefighters, but also policemen and civil protection people uh, were, were in this, in this uh, uh, program, but also the citizens, but there the, the percentages were a bit lower. Um, yeah, which is also understandable because they didn't come that close, at least not on purpose. Yeah, although some people went on purpose much closer. Um, but as far as I'm informed, uh, yes, there was this uh, big analysis, but I don't think that um, uh, that people nowadays still have some, some problems with that. But I cannot exclude it because I'm, uh, this happened also uh, almost 10 years ago, so uh, yeah. I don't have that much contact anymore with the local people. So let's hope not, of course. Let's hope not, exactly. I, at least we try to do everything to avoid that. And I think also this biomonitoring uh, program uh, has helped also the authorities at least to make uh, things visible. Huh? Because mm -hmm. if they wouldn't have done that, nobody would have known anything. Huh? And that's also the reason why I mentioned biomonitoring is for us really a quality check. We do it every time. We don't do it when we're sure that people are contaminated. No, we do it every time because we want not that people are contaminated. We have all the things to protect us. And at the end, we check to make sure that everything went right. And if not, what went wrong and how can we avoid that in the future? That's the reason why we do this biomonitoring. Okay. Um, and then one final question here. Um, are mandatory evacuations common at BISF or? Um, in case of in, I, in case of incidents within BSF, um, yes, we have evacuations. But then, I don't I hope that was was understand wrong. We do not then evacuate away from BSF. Yeah, we only go within BSF from one plant to another. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah, good. And that happens every time that there is a product release. And I don't know at nowadays how many product releases they have on, on a yearly base, uh, smaller and bigger ones. Uh, in the period that I was there, I think we had around about one release, but that could be also a smaller one uh, per month. Yeah, and that, then of course the sirens were activated, and and people had to sometimes only uh, go to the to the safe haven in their own plant. Uh, or in, in bigger uh, cases, they also had to, to go to safety heavens in, in another plant. But again, then it's only a, a transfer of people from one place to another. And it, I, we didn't come in a situation that, that everybody had to leave BSF because that's, that's also impossible. And therefore, we have also this, this safe heavens on scene. And safe heaven doesn't mean that you're also that you're only protected against toxic gases or something like that. You're also uh, in in um, uh, in, a, in a building which can also resist an explosion. That's okay. safe heaven. Okay, um, and then yeah, I saw one more question popping up. Um, so more a legal question, and I think so. What happened with the responsible or responsibles of the veteran disaster? Um, that's a very, um, uh, yeah, what, what would I say? At the end, they uh, wanted to bring the, the guy who was driving the train to court, uh, but then he did suicide when he was in jail. 
Okay. So we didn't come to a trial. So it's very sad. Yeah, indeed, sad, uh, sad story then. Yep, very sad story. Okay. Um, well, if there are no questions anymore, so I don't see any further questions, um, then I would like to thank you again for the lecture. So thank you very much for the interesting uh, talk. I learned a lot, lot about the different uh, implemented safety measurements and emergency plans, but also about the uh, off-site interventions with uh, Belintra and the biomonitoring um, after the, the incidents. And I hope, uh, of course, we will never see such uh, a big disaster as the veteran um, incident anymore, uh, as we had in veteran. So um, I want to thank you again for the very interesting um, talk. And also to the audience, um, I hope to welcome you at one of our next events. And for now, um, I wish you all a good evening and see you next time. Bye. See you. Bye-bye.